Hey everyone, Lane here, and I've got a very unexpected guest, a Bloomberg economist and Bloomberg columnist who is coming out in support of the fur ban. Uh, thanks for being here, Noah. Hey, I'm Noah Smith. I, I write for Bloomberg about economics and finance, and um, I'm here to talk about the fur ban. And you love bunnies, right? <laughs> and I do also love bunnies. But let's give you a quick summary about what's going on. Many of you have heard that we're trying to ban fur in the state of California. It's AB44, authored by Laura Friedman. We had a really important vote yesterday in the Judiciary Committee that we won nine to two to one. So there are nine eyes, two no's, and one abstention, which is great. But one of the main arguments used by the opponents of the fur ban is, is that it's going to have this economic impact. The farming industry is being, going to be damaged by this. And James Gallagher, who was probably the primary spokesperson for the fur industry at the hearing yesterday, was saying, you just don't understand how it's going to affect the lives of all these farmers. And I think Noah's got some pretty compelling and interesting arguments about why it's not going to be good for the California economy uh, uh, for us to, to allow this industry to continue to torture little bunnies like this. Um, but, but I think but before we start with that, I, I wanted to kind of just ask you how you got interested in this issue in the first place and, and why you're here today. I mean, because you're an economist. Why would you be talking about fur and bunnies? Well, I mean, you know, I, I care about bunnies because they're nice and, you know, I have some bunnies. And that's how I got alerted to the issue. But it goes way beyond, you know, like, let's save the cute little bunnies. <laughs> um, California, uh, California's destiny is not... In these, in these primary agricultural industries. Yeah. Um, obviously, there'll always be farming in California, and we have some very good farmland oh, here. Buddy. But um, fur, fur farming, skinning animals for their, for their fur is not what made California rich, and it's not what's going to make California rich in the future. Yeah. Um, and there's several reasons for that. One, one reason is because knowledge industries are really the source of the California economy, yeah. and getting rid of fur promotes the synthetic fur industry, which is a knowledge industry, because instead of just taking nature's bounty and skinning it, yeah. you instead create technology that allows you to more cheaply make this artificial substitute. Yeah. And innovate. then you innovate. That's yeah. right. And it's, it's innovation based. You can, you can do lots of productivity improvements in tech stuff and get smart people working on it. And ultimately, and, that, and that's stuff you can export. Those, those technologies for making like artificial fur are things you can export. Yeah. So that, so even Republicans should be behind this. this even is, this is creative destruction, right? Joseph Shepherder. Why? Why is James Gallagher saying this is bad for the the California economy? And right. I don't think. I mean, what you're saying basically is torching bunnies probably is not the future of the California economy. It's not. <laughs> and you know, there's... hopefully that's not a controversial statement. Right. And there's other reasons too. I mean, California uh, survives as an economy and is able to levy substantial tax rates on its workers because it has these knowledge industry clusters of San Francisco, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. because, and, and you know, increasingly Sacramento and some other sure. cities too, because it can attract a lot of um, you know, engineers, a lot of um, you know, knowledge workers of many kinds. Sure. And these people don't want to come to a place where you know, millions of rabbits are getting, are getting skinned in horrible conditions. Yeah. People are attracted to California because it has the reputation of being a liberal place, a tolerant yeah. place, a place that you can feel good about living in um, instead of having to be ashamed about living in. And that's why these smart people come here and power the California economy. Yeah, and even if you've ever been near a factory farm, have you been to Devil's Gulch? You were talking about No, I, I haven't been to Devil's Gulch. So I've you, seen the pictures. If you, if you come even near one of these big agricultural facilities, I mean, the stench, the external impacts right. of these industries are, are tremendous in, right. in a negative way to the local community. So... People I've been come to, to California. At the county fair. They are exhibited at the county fair. You can I've you seen can that. you can smell the stench from yeah. from ten miles away, and nobody wants to live near these farms. No one wants to drink the water that's downstream of these farms. And there's no reason these farms have to exist because we can innovate and replace all these fur products that come from massive industrial rabbit farms with synthetic furs that are more sustainable, that are cheaper to make, and that are better. They're warmer. They're warmer. They're more yeah. fashionable. And there's absolutely no reason for it at all. The only reason is because an entrenched industry has unfortunate political power over our system. And, and actually, one of the things I wanted to point out to everyone is it's, it's amazing seeing the coalition of people across all walks of life who are fighting for the fur ban. Noah, you yourself actually had an impact yesterday, in my opinion, at the hearing, because when the, the exemption for bunnies, and this is kind of one of the reasons we, we got in touch with Noah, because the fur industry was trying to push an exemption in the fur ban, saying, well, okay, even if you do ban fur from fox and mink and so on, bunnies are animals that are killed for food. So why waste the pelts? Why should we waste the pelts? So that was their argument. Like, that, that was their argument. So they argument. tried to exempt them. And Noah, you actually jumped into that Twitter debate, tagged Laura Friedman, and, and got a lot of really compelling arguments into the hearing yesterday. And I heard the arguments Laura Friedman making it, was making yesterday, and they were your arguments, the arguments you were making on Twitter. So why don't you tell people 
why you think the exemption makes no sense from an economic perspective. Right. Well, so imagine if you ban every kind of animal fur except rabbit. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the you know all the the rich dorks who just want to buy animal fur. <laughs> rich dorks, edgy, I like that. <laughs> all the people who would want to buy animal fur just because it's edgy and cool to be wearing a you know animal pelt. Uh, those people will all shift from fox or mink or whatever to rabbit. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the industry claims that, oh, we're just killing these rabbits for meat and then throwing the, the pellets away. Yeah. Um, we don't want to waste the stuff. Well, actually, no, that's, that's complete BS. Uh, <laughs> because if you increase the demand for rabbit fur you're gonna have a lot of rabbits being raised just for their fur, mm -hmm. and the meat will become a byproduct, and you'll have yep. a big expansion in this industry. So yeah, if you yeah. look at uh, farms like Devil's Gulch, you'll see yeah. they advertise rabbit pelts for $50 on Devil's Gulch's website. Oh. Um, fifty dollars is more than the meat of a rabbit. Jonah was not happy it. about that. Notice that he bit me right when you said yeah, Devil's Jonah Gulch was, sells rabbit he pelts doesn't for like $50. Devil's Gulch. Jonah right, definitely so, does not like Devil's Gulch. Neither should you. Neither should you, because <laughs> they're they're doing bad stuff. They're and, doing very bad stuff. And um, and so so obviously this is a, a disingenuous argument. If you, mm -hmm. it, this exemption would turn the bill from a fur ban into a fur monopoly giveaway the to industry. the rabbit industry. Yeah, it it's a complete Trojan horse, mm -hmm. and would make turn the bill from something very good to something very ambiguous. And we can't let it happen. So um, after they passed the the version of the bill yesterday without the exemption, which is mm -hmm. good because it yeah. means you know it would still ban rabbit fur. Yeah. Um, and your assembly member came out strongly in support of that. So oh, we yeah, tag David That's Cho, right. tweeted David, David Cho for being doing being a, Chew, a great yeah. advocate for the animals and. Um, he's, he's a really smart guy, Harvard yep. educated lawyer. He understands the economics behind this, which is one of the reasons why he said, this doesn't make any sense to me. And he made both the economic case and the moral case mm. saying from right. a moral perspective, why should we allow these rabbits to be tortured and killed for fur? Even if only 10 additional bunnies are killed, that's too many because we don't want any bunnies to be killed for their fur. Well, that's, that's true, mm -hmm. but it would be a lot more than 10. It, it would be, be a lot more than 10. I mean, I, I looked at the numbers and over a period of years, it would be millions. Yeah, millions, millions of rabbits killed. That's yeah, a and, lot of rabbits. And a lot of people don't realize that rabbits are actually the co most commonly used animal in the fur industry. It's one billion animals worldwide right. are used for fur. And, 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 and the reason is, I mean, if you saw us petting Jonah, the reason people love petting bunnies is because their fur is so soft and beautiful. Right. And it belongs on their bodies, not on ours. So, so Jonah is, is of the, one of the breeds of rabbit that's most popular for fur mm -hmm. and for meat and as meat, well. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, they, they would try to, to skin him and dye his fur because it's white. Yeah. And it can be dyed any, any color. Uh, color. Yeah. Um, there you can see Jonah. He's, <laughs> uh, he's a good little guy. He's a very good little guy. And... Um, but anyway, one of, the, one of the other things I wanted to point out is that, you know, the, the notion that the economic impacts matter at all to the state of California, I, I, granted, of course, there are going to be a few businesses that are not well served by this, but that's true of any transition in the American economy, and that's true of, of frankly, human civilization. You yep. know, if, if we said that any time anyone had any sort of negative impact, it wouldn't change, then we'd still be living in caves, right? You know, throwing feces at each other, which... You know, maybe it sounds fun to some people. Most of us don't <laughs> want to live in caves and throw feces at. I'm just kidding. Cavemen probably all the cavemen out there. I don't mean to offend you, cavemen. You're cool, but but change happens, and and the point isn't to stop change. It's to make sure change happens in a way that's ethical and humane to everyone. Right. And honestly, one of the things we've done at DXC is when we passed a ban on fur in San Francisco, we actually went to all the stores that were selling fur, and there weren't a whole lot of them. I mean, there were some big department stores that were going to be very affected by it, but there were a couple small businesses, and we said to them, "Let us help you transition." We want to be there for you That's and, great. and be That's part great. of the process of making you uh, a moral champion of causes and values that the people of San Francisco care about. And, and we've seen that through history, right? That there have been all sorts of industries, whether it's tobacco, fossil fuels, even going back to the you know, plantations in the 19th century, that did have to go through changes because of political movements. And that's okay. That's part of democracy. Right. And, and I mean, you know, I, that, is, that is great. And I, I feel almost, you know, sort of, like bringing it back to dollars and cents and economic issues, I feel almost bad about doing yeah. that after you know the moral arguments. But the dollars and cents are Doesn't also matter. important. Yeah. And California, um, California will not build export competitiveness with rabbit fur. <laughs> but California <laughs> will build export competitiveness with ethical alternatives that it yeah. can then export. 
building not only the brand of California, but yeah. the brands of the companies that make the uh, Can the you unpack what um, export competitives means to, that, to folks who don't know what an export is or what that, competitives means? Right. Yeah. California, to any, any region to, to really thrive economically has to sell stuff to other regions. Mm -hmm. So I don't just mean exports to countries like China or Europe or whatever. I mean selling stuff to New York, selling stuff to Florida, selling stuff yeah. to Texas. To Canada. And, mm -hmm. Right. And so just selling stuff beyond California's boundaries brings in a lot of money. Yeah. And then that money gets circulated around within the California economy yeah. and they call that a multiplier effect. For it, sure. it gets multiplied. Mm -hmm. But export industries, industries where you, where you sell stuff are outside, are very important. And so, you know, California's tentpole uh, export industries are software and entertainment, entertainment. Yeah. And, and those kind of things. Um, a lot of technology stuff... Um, Fur is not a technology yeah. industry. I'm just imagining Tim Cook. I don't know if you saw this press conference they just did about this new blend of entertainment and tech Apple's trying to do. They're trying to create a competitor to Netflix mm -hmm. and export it across the world, right? Right. Imagine Tim Cook standing up there with a bunch of celebrities talking about how we should kill bunnies. Right. We Let's, should kill bunnies. Let's kill bunnies right. and make that the core of the California economy. Folks, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. And we don't want to be North Dakota. We don't want to be North Dakota. No one wants to be North Dakota. North Dakota doesn't want to be North Dakota. <laughs> I'm mean, sorry to anyone from North Dakota, I'm but from I'm pretty Iowa. sure. I, no, Matt's from nice. Iowa, and Matt will tell you, Iowa does not want to be Iowa. Even the no, Iowa. I, I'm no, sorry I, to say this, but it's true. It's true. No, no, apologies no, no. to the Iowans out there. I don't, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to diss Iowa, yeah. but um, you know, like, there, there are going to be places in America that do farming. <laughs> Yeah. There don't have to be places in America that do fur farming, but there will be places in America that do lots of farming, and that's good. And we need and we need mm -hmm. farming, and I don't want to denigrate that. But that's um, and California will always have farming. California has good fertile farmland, and we're going to do yeah. something with that farmland. What we don't need is rabbit fur ranching. We yeah, don't right. need that industry. Yeah, we that don't need it. It's not going to help the California need. economy. And I would argue we don't need animal farming or factory farming at all. And and frankly, even if we did, that it's going to be replaced by automation very quickly. And so this is, this is not the future Maybe. of the Maybe. California economy. It's not the future of the Iowa economy. And there's a compelling argument that we should be helping folks transition, just like with manufacturing, away from these jobs that are ultimately going to be lost. I, I don't know right. if you've been following kind of the, the presidential campaign, but I'm, I'm a big fan of Andrew Yang. A lot of the people in this house are big fans of oh, really? Andrew okay. Yang and universal basic income because I think automation is going to take jobs away from farmers, from truck drivers, all these I'm, positions. I'm an Elizabeth are, Warren fan myself. But okay. I love Elizabeth Warren's right. proposal to break up the tech companies, hopefully this doesn't cause our live stream to get shut down because Facebook may be one of the companies that gets targeted. But I am a big fan of breaking up the big tech companies. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Did I say something controversial? That's Matt's not what this is about. Matt's that's looking at me with is. a funny face. I don't know if this, that's the right, <laughs> right approach. This should... is not what that's about. <laughs> we're talking about, we're talking like about fur farming. I, yeah. I, I don't know. But um, anyway. Well, Elizabeth Warren's sharp. She's All super, right. super smart. And I love she the is. Consumer she's Financial good. Protection Bureau. She's done really good work. But So I think I want to kind of dive into another point you made, which is there's... There's the economic effects, effects of California's brand, its image, but then there's also just the political impacts that, that what we want out of our, our nation, out of our state, out of our government is, is practices and policies and statements that are in alignment with our values, with our core identities. And one of the things about California that frankly has driven progress in the United States over the past hundred years is that we consider ourselves a progressive and forward thinking state. And, and one of the most damaging things about the fur industry and frankly the effort to, to carve out rabbits from the fur exemption, to the extent that the carve out actually does promote the fur industry rather than, than hurt it, is that most Californians promote intelligent changes in animal welfare. They want more protections for animals. And that's part of our brand, it's part of our image, it's part of our identity. And our democracy and our political figures should be living up to the values that we believe in as citizens and constituents. So, you know, I think we, we talked a lot about the economic impacts, but I think even even economic scholars are understanding, like, you know, one of my former professors was a drone, Asimoglu, who talked about institutions, the importance of trust in right. the political system. If you don't have trust in your political system, Did, did you mention falling. that you were also doing a PhD in economics? I was. You, so, have, you have that background. Yeah, so we're both kind of econ geeks, and, and I, in a former life, it was a long time ago, believe it or not, 10 years ago, actually it's 12 years ago now, I was a professor of law and economics, a visiting professor of law and economics at Northwestern. And my PhD was supposed to be in development economics. And one of the things we learned in development is for societies to flourish, there has to be trust in our institutions. And when institutions right. do things that are not in alignment with our values, not just the economy, the entire democracy falls apart. This is why you have civil wars. This is why you have corruption. I'm not saying if we don't pass the fur ban, there's going to be a civil war in California. But frankly, among people who love bunnies, there might be a civil war. <laughs> people are going to come out in numbers it's... against Laura Friedman and against the other people on 
on the assembly appropriations committee if they don't protect these animals. Right, and and so to, to bring it back to the legislation, I think that um, the the rabbit farmers are still trying to jawbone Laura Friedman behind the scenes mm -hmm. and get her to slip in the exemption, exemption for yeah. rabbit fur. And their new argument is that there's different kinds of breeds. There's mm -hmm. some rabbits that are meat rabbits and some so rabbits that are fur rabbits, yeah. and that they'd only want to allow the fur from the rabbits that are meat rabbits, which makes no Central. sense because yeah. if these were just meat rabbits whose fur you couldn't sell, why are you pushing so hard for it's the ability exactly. to sell their fur? Yeah, but no, it's, it's completely inconsistent. And, um, and so, so it's, it's complete BS. Any rabbit that can be raised for meat Hi, is, can also be raised for fur and will be raised for fur in, on mass if the exemption goes through. Yeah, and in fact, at Devil's Gulch, they have monies exactly like Jonah. Exactly like Literally, that. they look exactly like Jonah, yeah. and they're the same species, the same breed. One of the most common be breeds for, pelts for meat and, for and fur. So, so they're, they're lying. They're, what breed know, is this? New Zealand white. New Zealand white? Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. Um, ironically, from California, not from New Zealand. Yeah, interesting. There was already a brand called California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, what are the next steps? I mean, I, so, so basically, I think that Laura, Laura Friedman understands the argument and she understands that the exemption is bad. And Thanks partly to you. Thank you very much, Noah. I do, I can. Tweeting at her. Yeah. Uh, we all do our part. And so um, she understands that it's bad, mm -hmm. but sh they will be talking to her as much as they can, calling her, jawboning her behind the scenes, mm -hmm. trying to get her to slip just a little exemption in when in fact it's yeah. not little, it's, it would actually be invalidating most of the, the bill and so they're going to be doing this and so basically we have to make it clear that if the rabbit for exemption goes through in any form um there's gonna be a price right there that's that's not going to be forgotten people will remember how that the the fur ban was essentially eviscerated yeah uh by that and i think i i think and i hope that that she understands it's very encouraging to see her her get those arguments. I think she's a good person and yes, she's she trying is. to do good things. So we and should just have to encourage and support her in doing right. that. And we just have to make, make sure, sure she that feels that, 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 that she's going to be supported if she does the right thing, even if it comes at some cost to her. Yes, exactly. Right? If some of the, the moderates on the committee end up attacking her. Right. People, people remember these things. Mm -hmm. And, and this, you know, this isn't the first time that special interest industries have pushed behind the scenes for carve outs mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. industry that ended up uh, dramatically weakening what would otherwise be a good law. Yeah. Can you tell about another recent example with Proposition 2? Proposition 2 or Proposition 12? Oh, I thought it was Proposition 2 So that um, oh, you were talking about. I, I mentioned it. I just mentioned that they had the, the thing that applied to veal, but then they had uh, yeah, yeah. for beef. Okay. Yeah, so Proposition 12 is the most recent one. Oh, that was 12. I'm sorry. Yeah, 2 is the original one that was passed back in 2008, I believe it was. Right. 12 was kind of a reenactment of it, but yeah. Got they... It. they they had a carve out basically for animals that uh, are, are going to be raised for meat in, in, in the beef industry, but instead of being killed at six months as veal, they're killed at one year or a year and a half instead. So you can raise animals in exactly the same situation, in exactly the same context, torture them in the same way that most California voters find just unconscionable. Right. But because you've marketed the product a little bit differently or the animal lives a little bit longer, you're no longer subject to the regulations right. under Proposition 12 and Proposition right. 2. And this has been a big problem. Frankly, enforcement is also a problem because lots of times these laws have passed. And so with 2 and 12, I would argue the biggest problem is just lack of enforcement because many of these who's companies... Who's going to check how old the cows yeah, are? And, and who's going to check that the animals are not being confined? And in many right. cases, the only people who are checking are us and we report it, they end up charging us instead of the farmer. <laughs> For trespass or for so harassment or intrusion on privacy the, or something like the that. The solution to this is to stop special interest from slipping in these these yeah. Trojan horse awesome. exemptions yeah. uh, before it happens. And this so is, far, uh, this is pretty damn cute. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I don't know what he's doing, but he's. So far, we're 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 being successful in in yeah. preventing this this Trojan horse from getting into this bill. Yeah, and it's it's because lots of people like you have made phone calls, have yeah. signed up. Go to furshistory.org, and you can find all the information you need about upcoming votes. Right. You can also sign up to our our support list, and if you're on our support list, you'll get notifications about what to do, what the most recent kind of call to action is, so we can be as effective as possible in making sure the industry doesn't get its way. Right, and um, so my fear is that once the pressure's off and once people stop calling the offices, Laura Friedman will meet with the farmers and the farmers will yell at her enough yeah. in closed, behind closed doors, in back rooms, Yeah, they'll yell at her strongly enough Well, she'll slip in some exemption that she thinks is token yeah, or symbolic small, yeah, just, just to satisfy them compromise. but which they know is actually eviscerating the entire bill and is a yeah. trojan horse yeah. so we've got to keep the pressure up people need to keep calling her office and saying that any rabbit fur exemption yeah 
will will basically largely invalidate the fur ban. Yeah. So so keep up calling Laura Friedman's office and registering if you if you care about you know the fur issue at all. Keep calling because you can't let the pressure off for even a minute because then the bad guys are going to slip in behind closed doors and mm -hmm. and you know intimidate. Um, uh, legislators into doing what they want and we can't let them do that. Yeah, no, we've seen that happen so many times. And folks, this is not a hypothetical concern that Noah's raising because we heard James Gallagher on the committee basically say this, that, you know, why do we have to be so extreme? Let's make a compromise. Let's let's be moderate. Let's not always be extreme. And the way to compromise in this case is let's carve out the rabbits. Right. And so this is this Complete is already BS. a proposal on the table. And and we know it, it's a proposal that, that could become the law if we don't do something about it. So we should challenge. I mean, right. the, you exemption know, I, is, say, the exemption is not yet in the bill. Yeah. If they put it in the bill, that's really bad. Yeah. So, so far, they haven't put this exemption in, and that's good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just basically, people have to keep calling Laura Friedman's office or their own representatives. Yeah, you I'd can, say you know, your, own your own representative is even representative more important well. than Laura. So, you what, can what find I who that is online. And, and what we need to do, the next step is the Appropriations Committee, I think, has 18 members. But the Appropriations Committee is affected by the full assembly because it goes into what's called a suspense file. So any legislation that has a fiscal impact on the state of California that's likely to be $150,000 or more doesn't get a regular hearing. Instead, it goes into an appropriations suspense file. And sometime in the middle or the end of May, the Appropriations Committee, based on leadership and, and pressures and analysis that's been done by the full assembly, will decide which of these bills go to a full floor vote. And this is the way a lot of bills kill, get killed. So around 30% of bills that end up in the suspense file don't get all the way through, mostly because of little disputes like this. Like maybe there's a dispute about rabbit fur and the worst outcome, in my opinion, would be nothing gets passed at all. Because I agree with you, it'd be a, a huge and devastating loss if the, fur, the rabbit fur exemption were put in place. But one of the reasons I would still support the bill very vociferously if the rabbit fur exemption was in place is getting that bill in place will allow us to ban fur in other states. It'll allow us to go back again in the future and hopefully carve this exemption out. See, no, out see I, I wouldn't agree that. No, I don't agree. Okay. I, I wouldn't, if the rabbit fur exemption were in place, I would, I would oppose the bill. bill. Because, because it would create this monopoly. And, it would yeah. create this monopoly. It's this yeah. giant giveaway to agribusiness, and it sets a horrible precedent, not yeah. just for us in the future, but for other states as yeah. well, enacting fur bans. Yeah. And so it's turning a turning a fur ban into a mon fur monopoly giveaway yeah. to a specific yeah, yeah. fur industry is is symbolic. Like, y you know, the it, it's much closer to neutral on the mm -hmm. on the terms of number of animals getting killed. Uh, it. it takes away most of the good impact there and symbolically it makes it worse because it yeah, says yeah. oh giving a monopoly to yeah. this one for industry is okay, is okay. at that mm -hmm. point i would definitely strongly oppose the, the bill, bill if the yeah. exemption goes through because we can come back next year and then and then push for the push for the, for the whole ban yeah. it's not that's not a compromise we want yeah, to yeah. take that's not worth it yeah. and we shouldn't and you know there there it, it's it's not a compromise we should take it it's yeah. Give, you know, a, make, turning it into a monopoly giveaway bill is not yeah, not, not a good thing from an economic perspective or from an ethical perspective. Right, yeah. economic or no, I ethical. Can see that. I can see that argument. So, so there you have it, folks. An economist becomes an abolitionist right before your eyes. <laughs> he's 100% on, you take it all, we get yes. nothing at all. I mean, yes. I, I think there's a compelling argument yeah. for that. So, I mean, we'll have to revisit when the time comes. Let's just hope we don't have to make that decision. But the first best scenario for all of us is for AB 44 to pass as it's currently written. With no amendment. I mean, no, we have to make it clear that if rabbit fur is exempted, um, that will not be forgotten. Yeah. It will not be a, an issue that goes away next year. Yeah, yeah. It will not be something people stop talking about next year. It will be remembered, you know, if, if Laura Friedman allows this exemption into the bill because farmers yelled at her in, behind closed doors, mm -hmm. it will not be forgotten that that happened. And, you know, she will then be remembered as yeah. the person who had a chance to ban rabbit fur and get and that passed yeah. and, and didn't do it yeah. and gave this monopoly to these bad people. Yeah. And having, having gotten to know some bunny people, I can tell you the bunny people are fierce. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize that dogs and cats are obviously the number one and number two species mm -hmm. of companion animal in the United right. States. Number three, you know what it is, right? Bunnies. Is it bunnies? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know Bunnies that. are number three. So there's, there's a lot of other domesticated so animals that people have in their own homes, horses, all sorts of things. But the, the number three species that people have and take care of is, is bunnies. And, and we're talking about many, many millions, um, probably tens of millions of bunnies across um, tens of millions of households, I should say. Not yeah. more than, more than tens have of bunnies. millions of bunnies. Because lots of households have multiple bunnies. So yeah. it's tens of millions of households across the United States of America. And they care. They care immensely. People care. And if, if a rabbit for exemption 
of any kind is slipped into this bill at the last minute, that will not be forgotten. Yeah. There will there will be a record. It's unexpected supporters. You know, I, I didn't even know you until a couple days ago. And here's yeah. this Bloomberg columnist who normally writes about jobs and the economy and tech and, and, and uh, you know, Alan Kruger's recent passing. I mean, they've seen all your stories and you wouldn't expect someone like this is ad as adamant as you are. I mean, you're in many ways, this, Noah is more of an abolitionist right now in this conversation than I am. And so yeah. you're going to see a lot of other people and unexpected right. support. You might, be <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. you might be right about it before. Maybe we shouldn't support it if there's a rabbit, for example. No, That's a should, conversation no. Come, come, come back and do it right the next year. I think Noah's going to come after us if we support it. So <laughs> That's this, true. This is a dangerous conversation <laughs> That's right. right now. I will never, so Laura, I will I, never forget. Laura, please do not carve out <laughs> yeah, bunnies because my safety depends. Do not do it. My safety depends on us not carving out the bunnies. Yes. Um, so what else do you want to talk about? Um, one thing else, one thing I wanted to talk about is I, I found, I don't know what you've found, I found among economists, you would think that economists are very hard-headed, practical, but I found among economists, there's a lot of animal advocates and a lot of vegetarians. And maybe it was just because I was at MIT, but I find that a lot of people who have that, you know, a Jeremy Bentham utilitarian perspective on life. So another person who is an unexpected animal rights advocate, Cass Sunstein. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, huge, you know, he, huge he, animal. He's also my coworker at Bloomberg. I did not know that. He, so we both write for Bloomberg. Yeah, I co-authored a paper with them on climate change and animals. So this paper I was talking about, where oh, we no. tried to do an economic analysis of climate change's impact on animals, it was with Cass Sunstein. Oh, and you find nice. a lot of these people are extremely hard-headed, numbers-based people. You wouldn't think, you know, conservatives often. So another supporter of the fur ban, Jack Welch. Oh wow! Did you know that? Jack I, Welch, he wrote a letter for us. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. he wrote a letter for the fur ban, and it's one of the most influential letters. It's a letter that Laura Friedman's. You know, that's held great. up in her hands and said, he Republicans knows, should support this. He knows the future of California industry is not, is not skinning bugs. animals alive. Exactly. Jack Welch has always been about innovation. I mean, he's infamous for, what, firing 10% of his people every year. So he's a brutal capitalist. Uh, yeah, no, but, he's, I mean. <laughs> but yeah. he agrees with the fur ban. If even you know? he agrees with the fur ban, then, you know. Yeah. And again, I mean, I don't agree with Jack Welch. We shouldn't just fire 10% of the people in our company. And if we do mm. have to transition those 10%, we should be compassionate and find Jack, new jobs for them, retrain them. Jack Welch had the major problems with CEO, income. but he's right about the fur ban. He's right about the fur ban. But the point is, this is an issue that Republicans so, and Democrats are all getting behind. Everybody, all Americans are getting it's, behind this. It's because the, the future, future. The future, absolutely. It's the future. Yeah. If you, if you... If you carve out an exemption and allow rabbit fur, you are you are fighting the future, future yeah. and that's a bad idea. And you're promoting a monopoly, which and is, you're promoting. I don't think anybody anybody wants more monopolies. In, right. In here's this here's the thing. Um, so economists have really been focusing in in the last four or five years on the increasing problem of monopolies. A lot mm -hmm. of MIT economists like um, David Outer has been focused yeah. on this. A lot of people monopoly power is growing. Um, strong dominant companies are taking over industry after industry and we're not just talking about like Facebook or tech yeah. companies or something. We're talking about, you know, like chicken processing. Tyson Chicken is this yeah. horrible monopoly. And so there's all these monopolies and monopolies are, you know, they're they're much worse when the government steps in and says, mm -hmm. Here, you can have this let's monopoly, monopoly. Let's subsidize for free. You. We're let's, gonna let's we're gonna legally protect you. Yeah. enact this monopoly. Sanctions. So yeah. you're the only farmers that can sell fur in California. Yeah. It creates concentrations of power that are it's, dangerous for it's yeah. exactly going in the wrong direction for the American economy to give away monopolies to this one industry. Yeah, you're right. And and this is kind of not just an animal rights issue, this is a broader issue yeah. about, about American is. politics and yep. you know, you've got uh, capital in the twenty first century. I'm dropping the ball on who wrote that. Who wrote Capital? Piketty. Piketty. Thomas Piketty. Thomas Piketty about kind of this transition and not just in the American, but frankly, Western democracies and frankly, the entire globe right. away from labor and towards capital. And yep. partly it's because of monopoly power, this yep. huge concentration so, so of power. This is, so this, this issue is a, is a small, small piece of example, a big a thing. Problem. Um, let's not give monopolies yeah. to, to rabbit farmers. But it's, it's a reason progressives especially should not be supporting that. Yes. Right? Progressives yes. should not be supporting that because right. we want to get away from this. We want to give power to the people, power to the workers and not to... One industry that has, frankly, just a, a, a stranglehold grip on our political system. Because for, even in California, California, you'd think it's a tech state, it's an entertainment state. It's shocking how difficult it is to pass any laws that affect, affect farmers and, and affect factory farmers in particular because of the political power they have. Um, and, yeah. and Devil's Gulch is an example of this, where a simple common sense regulation that, was, that should have been enacted in Marin County. Do you know about this fight a couple years ago? No. About the slaughter ban? So there was an effort to to just retain a, a simple common sense policy that you should not have slaughterhouses right next to people's homes and backyard slaughter should not be permitted. You know, why should you be slaughtered? And it was mainly bunnies and chickens, that sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty much everyone in the county was supportive of this because not only the animal rights advocates and the animal lovers, but the NIMBY people. They just don't want right. slaughterhouses yeah, who in the backyard. Who wants a screaming animal in a bloody cesspool in their backyard? 
like emanating chemicals and disease and all sorts of disgusting stuff yep. in their own neighborhood. So no one wants that. everyone was against it. And the one party that was against it was Devil's Gulch. You mean the they were for industry. it? Or, I'm sorry, for it. Right. They, they wanted, wanted to allow this. They wanted to do the And they won. They won in, in the face of like 95% opposition. And you got Mark Levine up there. He's otherwise a progressive in Marin and Sonoma County talking about how he has to you know, be beholden to Devil's Gulch. And it's, it's What's it's going on with Mark Levine? Why, why is he so beholden to that one company? You know, I don't know. It's very confusing to me. I mean, I think it's, it's partly because there's still this idea in American politics, especially on the right, but even on the left, that there's something intrinsically American about farming, right? That this started as a farming country. I know as recently as, I think, 100 years ago, I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure it was 100 years ago, half the American public was, wasn't involved in agriculture. Right. Does that sound right to you? You might know better than I. Uh, I'm pretty it, sure. It, was it might more. have been 200 years ago. It was years more. Ago. 200 um, years ago? Oh, no, no. I mean, oh, it was more people. More than more people, people yeah. yeah. So most people were farmers, and all the founding fathers were farmers. So it's, it's part of our political culture, right. our political identity, that farming is just this intrinsically and traditional American practice. And I why think why do you farm like, some corn? Yeah, why not farm some corn? <laughs> or something. Yeah, and, like, and, and honestly, when people actually look at the farms, when you look at Devil's Gulch, when you look at kind of uh, a Smithfield, when you look at a Purdue or a Tyson... These are so far afield what people's vision of it, it actually is, it, right. is, right? They're not, they're not you can, these little places. You can places. play the, like, I'm a folksy farmer, but yeah. in fact, you're, you're a business. You're, you're an industrial a combine of slaughter. Yeah, that's making an enormous amount of money off of slaughtering animals yep. and polluting the environment in ways that most Americans right. and most Californians do not support when they see it. And that brings me to the final issue I want to talk about, which is consumer confidence and trust, right? And one of the most disturbing things about the fur industry, and Devil's Gulch is a great example of this, because did you know, do you know who the owners of Devil's Gulch are? Uh, Mark Pasternak? Yeah, but you, I, that, that sounds right. But do you know who, like, what the profession is or what, what no. his wife's profession is? They're vets. Really? Yeah. And, and they do such a good job of portraying themselves as people who care for animals, who have the interest in the animals in their hearts. And we have and to place they, them in cages. And then they skin them alive by they the skin them tens and, of thousands. And they, and, and they confine them in cages, yep. sometimes six to seven to a cage. They never get to step outside. That's sociopathy. It, it kind that of is, <laughs> what, what kind of person? He said it on me. That? This is the blueprint. That's columnist. sociopathic. So, so that is against. I can't imagine that. No, I just can't I would imagine. Get in I can't imagine being a veterinarian yeah. and then like. And killing all your animals. Creating, you know, creating industrialized yeah. like slaughter. And, and we know this because we, we've seen the images and, and, you know, activists have been inside Devil's Gulch. And you've got these lines and lines of cages where bunnies, yeah. exactly like Jonah, are sitting in wire cages their entire lives. There's these piles of feces underneath them. There's dead and rotting bunnies sometimes. These animals are obviously not getting the care they deserve if they're it's dead terrible. and rotting in it's the facility. Terrible. And, 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 and we have they're assembly members like Mark Levine supporting them. Feet. Yeah, they, they, yeah. So did you, do you know what Mark percentage Levine, of fox farms? I don't know about bunny farms. Do you know what percentage of foxes have what's a, a syndrome called bent leg syndrome just from standing in wire? Their entire lives? Yes. I mean, rabbits will get, like, all of them. Yeah. So it's about 50%. Okay. And these foxes don't even live that long. Right. They're in these cages for six months, nine months at a time. And by the time they're done standing on this wire for nine months, their legs are bent. They can't even walk properly. Right. It's right. Horrible. So this is, this is systematic torture of animals. And, and you have the industry saying this is humane. This is, this is, this is animal welfare. Yeah. And, and the, the push the fur industry made at the hearing yesterday, which is the same push they made at the Water Parks and Wildlife Committee, is you don't have to ban it because we can regulate it with a program called Fur Mark. It's, although it's not even real regulation because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be required by law. It would, it would be Com something complete that's Complete smoke and mirrors. Complete smoke and bullshit. Mirrors. Yeah. No. Rabbit, rabbit fur exemption is handing a monopoly to the very worst uh, yeah. industry. And, and contrary to consumer trust, consumer yes. confidence, we know, I mean... Consumer right. confidence is so important. Part of the brand of California is transparency and accountability. That right. When our government says something, when corporations say something, you know, Google and Apple and Amazon, I mean, I know there's, there's debates about this. They all claim we're trying to sort the world's information, trying to be as transparent as possible to, to, to instill trust in our consumers. And we see what happens when there's no trust. Look I at mean, Facebook. Right. When every, there's no trust, everything falls apart. Every industry has its problems, but I would rather have Facebook posting you know stupid fake news and <laughs> rabbits getting skinned alive yeah and lying to consumers about it e right every about it. every industry has its problems every industry needs regulation every industry is susceptible to monopoly etc yeah uh but this is no good this is no not good at all. no rabbit her no. industry no so i, I want right. to i want to ask everyone to share well let's wrap up and take some questions from people on the live stream okay but okay. i want to encourage everyone to share this live stream and please comment that you're sharing click that share button comment you're sharing because when you share, it encourages other people to share, and it also mm -hmm. increases our page rank. So, you know, every time you share, probably anywhere between 10 and 100 other people will see this. So this is one easy way you can take part in our movement. 
and be an activist yourself. Social media is incredibly important. And tell to your friends. The word out. Tell your friends to go to furrishistory.org. Sign post up on to, your Instagram, post, post on your Instagram, Facebook. Post on Twitter. Tweet to the assembly members in the appropriations committee. Yes. They need to hear that the fur ban should be something that comes out of committee, that goes to the floor vote, that right. there should not and be no exemption for, for rabbit fur. <laughs> do, you think, do you think Noah said that enough times? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he'll say it a couple more because times. People might only watch five minutes That's of true. the stream. So you got to see it. So they need to say it over and over again. Repeated, right? But let's see if there are any mm-hmm. questions. I mean, this is a fascinating conversation showing. I, actually, let me just finish one thought. The final thought I had is that in many ways, the founders of the intellectual school behind economics, Jeremy Bentham. I mean, he was the, you know, the utilitarian right. who started it all. Yep. Did you know he was a huge animal advocate? I did not. I yeah, and he believed that. And Jeremy Bentham predicted in 17 whatever, when he was writing all of his famous books about utilitarianism, which is the foundation of modern economics, that the day will come, first of all, he predicted the day will come where, where we start stop discriminating against uh, people of color and women, and those predictions have come true. And back then, it was farcical. You know, they're, they're on the way to becoming true. Well, they're on the way to become true. We made enormous progress. There's yeah. still huge problems. But at least it's, it's, it's more difficult today to be unapologetically racist and unapologi- unapologetically sexist than it was in 1700. It right. is more difficult. <laughs> it is more difficult to be a racist today yes. than it was in 1700 when slavery was common. I mean, obviously, right? Trump can still do it. Still, Trump can still do it. But, yeah, yeah but, it's, it's but, harder. But the other thing he predicted in that same line, it's in the same sentence, is that the day will come when we stop exploiting people of color, when we stop exploiting women, and he also said animals. That was included in his prediction. Jeremy Bentham's first two predictions came work. true. I think his third prediction will come true. And it's one of the reasons why, again, all these pragmatic, numbers-driven, statistically-minded, you know, scientifically-minded economists are animal advocates, too, because they believe in utilitarianism. All suffering is wrong, and all suffering is equal. All right, so let's take, let's some, take questions. some questions. Right. And I'll ask you again to share this live stream. Click that share button. It's going to make a big difference if you share it. Other people will see this. And we would take your questions. This is a rare op- opportunity to talk to an incredibly smart columnist at Bloomberg who, who writes to you know, a huge number of people. Bloomberg is one of the biggest economics uh, papers and, and, and publications in the world. And, and here's our chance to ask them some questions. So, let's Matt, go. do you have any yeah. questions for us? Uh, so, one, uh, I'll just clarify uh, Kathleen, or I'm just trying to say Kathleen. Um, I thought the fur ban means banning all furs. So just to clarify, that's proposed. It's not in there right now, but they're trying to, the industry is trying to do that. Um, yes, also, clarifying they're trying to exempt rabbit right. fur. It is not in the fur ban right now. Yesterday, they passed the fur ban. They, they voted on a version of the fur ban with no exemption, which is good, which yeah. is all fur. And, uh, and they got it through, which is mm-hmm. good. There is still time for... The, the bill's author, like Laura Friedman, to slip in the exemption before yeah. the final, final uh, version goes to the governor's desk. So we're winning for now. The exemption is not in there yet, but it could be in there, so we need to keep the pressure up to make sure that it doesn't get in there. Yeah, and this is the time where these sorts of things happen, when a bill goes into suspense file, because it's not a public vote, and there isn't even a public record of who votes on the Appropriations Committee for bills or, or against bills in the suspense file. It just gets passed to the House or it doesn't. And if right. it gets passed the House, it could get passed the House in an amended form without anyone even knowing why the change happened. So now is the time right. where we have to really put yes. the pressure on. We're, right. Now is the time to keep the pressure on. Yeah. Other um, questions? Julie says, Noah, you should take your bunny rescue friends to visit Assemblymember Laura Friedman. <laughs> I will. She's in L.A. I will drive down. Nice. All right. She's in Sacramento usually. So you could take, take Oh, she's in Sacramento. Okay. Well, so you could take them to Sacramento. We don't have to go to LA. We'll drive up to have. Sacramento. Yeah. I mean, we, we'll, we will drive. We'll, we'll go. Before she'll we even do us, that, she'll meet us. I mean, she probably will. I mean, you can walk right into her office with your bunnies and say, I'm a columnist from Bloomberg. These are my yeah. bunnies. And have some bunnies. We cannot yeah, have some bunnies. Yeah. You know, we didn't actually tell that story. We're going to tell the story about how you came to your bunnies and how you became an adult. Oh, well, bunnies. it's okay. We don't have to tell that Let's go with more questions. Let's go to questions. Um, yeah, so, uh, Diana, uh, asked, I would like to know what motivated Laura Friedman to be the author of the bill. She doesn't seem like an animal rights type. Yeah, I think she cares about animals like all Americans and, and like, frankly, like all people on this planet that when you see any being suffer, you're moved by it. And, and so I think she is an animal rights advocate and we're proud to have her support. Is she a vegan? Is she kind of someone who has been steeped in animal rights culture over the past 10 years of her life? Probably not. But she's getting there. And, and frankly, she's going through the same evolution our entire society is. I mean, I was talking to Noah about some really promising numbers in terms of awareness about the cruelty to animals, concern about the cruelty to animals. But uh, something like, I think it's over 90% of people think that the suffering of animals and violence against animals in food production and fur production is wrong. Um, but 75% of Americans also believe that animals are usually raised well in, in farms. And, people and don't they just know. don't know. Yeah, they don't, don't know. know. They think, I mean, a lot of people still believe, it's, it's shocking how many otherwise intelligent people believe that fur comes from just trimming their hair. That you just They're thinking of sheep. 
They're thinking of wool, right? Right. They're thinking of which wool. Which is no. violent and terrible. You skin the animal a lot. <laughs> you skin the animal. This, this, you actually have to have the skin of the animal to make it for a coat. Yeah. That's one. That's what makes the coat warm. Yes. Right. It's the hair and the skin. You don't shave it. So Laura is is just like so many other people. She's awakening, and we're seeing statistics like thirty two percent of Americans agreeing that animals should have the same rights as human beings. Forty seven percent of Americans saying they'd support a ban on slaughterhouses. And while survey data is always a little, we were, we were talking a little bit about how surveys are very inconsistent and they're tentative and not particularly robust predictions of future policy. But at the same time, when survey numbers are going in the right direction, that's a good sign for the future. Right. And so, as for why Laura Freeman is doing this, we're we're not quite sure, but I applaud it. Yeah. And I applaud that she's resisted that exemption so far. That's yeah. been great. And she know? needs our support. She needs, she, our, she needs our support she to need, continue resisting it. Right, yes. Yeah. All right, uh, Jude uh, is asking to summarize, I know you touched on this, maybe summarize why the fur ban is bad for the California economy or why it could be. It's not, it's not bad. So fur, fur ban is good. Yeah. Why? So, so fur ban. Or I'm, or I'm sorry. Yeah, good. That's why, why, fur, why it's good for fur ban is good economy. for the California economy because basically it, it shifts us away from from low growth, uh, low concentration industries to high growth knowledge industries. It, mm -hmm. it shifts our economy toward the kind of things we want to be doing in the future, where technological improvements are possible, where we can export both technology and products to the rest of the country and the rest of the world, instead of you know, this very basic low value added parochial kind of, um, you know, industry of, of fur farming, uh, which is going nowhere in the world. That's going nowhere. It's a dead end thing. We need to shift to the industries yeah. of tomorrow. And, and this pushes us in that direction. And it also improves California's brand for the people who will feel good about living in a state that doesn't allow these animals to be tortured and skinned for their fur. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we were joking earlier about probably the last time fur was an important part of any region's economy was Quebec in the 1700s. Right, you know? that's right. Like, Do we want to be 1700s <laughs> Quebec? No. <laughs> Let, let's not be 1700 Quebecians or Quebe Quebecers? Quebec we're, we're better than that. We're probably better than that. All right, next, <laughs> next question. Uh, all right, so I, I think this is slightly trolling, but would be uh, useful. Uh, Bobby says, it? we are in America where capitalism rules. You don't ban something like you're in Russia. What do you have to say to that? It's <laughs> um, yeah, like we're in Russia. Russia has a huge fur industry. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, let, let's let them have it. Russia's all about extractive value, you know, like, like low value industries. Russia's about digging up oil out of the ground and killing stuff. Let's, let, let's leave that to Russia. Well, but look, actually, let's unpack this question a little more because I think this question actually is, it points out a, kind of an incorrect assumption and a misunderstanding of what capitalism means because right. capitalism doesn't mean you don't ban anything, right? right? There are things you ban, and they're usually things that cause some external impacts, externalities, yeah. right? Capitalism, so, capitalism, capitalism it's needs a push. Yeah, and, and capitalism, even if you're a full-on believer in capitalism, Robert Nozick was a full-on believer in capitalism. Anarchy, state, and utopia, probably the most famous libertarian in, in Amer maybe American history, frankly. And you know what Robert Nozick believed? He believed that killing animals was wrong, even for food. All right. You read Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And you know what? He believed that killing animals is wrong. Why? Because capitalism isn't just about allowing the economy to flourish. It's about keeping the residents of, of the economy safe enough that they're not facing violence. Not that rabbit fur industry is going to make the economy it's flourish. Bigger, Jesus. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, um, uh, you know what? If you really care about capitalism, you should hate monopoly. Yes. <laughs> Imagine right. giving a monopoly on, on rabbit fur to the rabbit fur industry. Yeah. That should make any capitalist that was extremely off. angry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, we're going to do, in terms of capitalism, we're going to do better with the synthetic fur industry than with the rabbit fur industry. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, so Emily says, what's the best thing we can do to keep the pressure up? Call Laura Friedman. <laughs> her, call her office. Call I'm your own representative. I'm actually going to suggest people don't call Laura Friedman unless they're constituents. Okay, okay. Or, or someone like you. So All Noah right. Smith can call Laura Friedman <laughs> because he's a columnist at Bloomberg. And you can he's do got both. A big you audience. can do all. <laughs> You can call, but call your representative. Call your and, representative and, and tell them, them to talk to Laura. Oppose Friedman. the exemption. Make sure yeah. there's no exemption. We just don't want to flood our office with phone calls and get her too irritated. Okay, that's that's All my right. take. Fair on enough. This. Fair enough. Well, so you I think that I drive to her office. Well, you're you're Noah Smith. Oh, I, I'm not special. I'm not. No, special. you are. You're, okay. <laughs> columnists and, and people. This is what they call grass tops, right? There's a the grassroots. Grassroots should focus on their assembly member or their senator. I'll do it again. But call your assembly member. Tell them no exemption for rabbit fur. Yeah. I'll say what else you can do. Please go to firsthistory.org and sign up because there's a lot of things we need to do over the next couple of months. This is going to be another four or five months before we win this campaign. And every, every week there's new things that need to be done. So the best way to get involved is go to firsthistory.org. We've had 5,000 people sign up to speak with the fur man. 
Cassie's done an amazing job of setting up a beautiful website. Go to, and Jake and, and other folks like Michael Lanos, go to furthestissue.org, sign up, and ask your friends to sign up to support the Furband campaign. We'll send you text messages, emails, we'll give you updates. You can even start a little Furband team in your local region. We've had people doing outreach on the streets, getting other people to sign up. That's how we're gonna create the exponential effects and exponential growth. We need to ensure not only the bunnies and the mink and the fox, but eventually all the animals being exploited by these horrible, violent industries are given the protection they deserve. So sign up and get involved immediately. Next question. All right, Julie is uh, pretty insistent. Julie already asked the uh, question. Different Julie. Is it a different Julie? Uh, I don't There's think it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's we, go. Let's... We love Julie. All right, let's, All right, let's right, ask Julie another says, question. Julie um, th says, so the fur ban um, is going on suspense and appropriations, mm -hmm. and um, for one thing, Laura will have to prioritize a bill, and two, she will have to work with appropriations to bring the, quote, cost of California under $150,000, so... Um, maybe I think it has to come out of. I mean, it, it, it can stay. It stays in suspense if it's one hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. But bills come out of suspense all the time. There's just a roll call vote near the end of May, and we have to get it high enough on the priority list of the committee leadership and, frankly, the entire assembly leadership that it's one of the bills that gets out. And and again, I'm not sure about this, but the statistic I saw is that seventy percent of bills in suspense do go to a floor vote. So thirty percent of them will die in committee, which is mm -hmm. a lot. That's one of three chance, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But. But yeah, so the good thing is the chair of the Appropriations Committee is Lorena Gonzalez, and we have a very active chapter in San Diego, amazing activists like Dave Engler and, and Stacy Stacy and Gino and Melanie Arkey, who are going to be pushing hard in San Diego to make sure Lorena Gonzalez sees this bill as a priority. And we already know Lorena Gonzalez is on the Judiciary Committee, and she was one of the people who said, you know, forget about fur. I feel like all animals deserve freedom. You know, I don't, factory farm animals, every animal should be free. So she seems like the sort of person who's going to be a strong advocate for animals, but we're still going to need to push because it's not just enough for Lorena Gonzalez to support this. We need the assembly leadership and the assembly as a whole to want this bill to come to a floor vote. All right. Paula says, can we, comp uh, can we propose uh, compassionate solutions for fur farmers to transition? Your thoughts on that? I mean, I've written a little bit about farmers. transitions. So, in, in so the, American the thing, economy. the thing about these the fur farmers is that fur isn't the only thing they they do. Yeah, they also do meat farming and other things, and that's not going to be banned under this bill. And so, I don't. You know, they'll have to scale down their operations a bit, but they're not going to have to. You know, it's not going to be like every farmer in you know, every like animal rancher is out of a job in California. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Um, in terms of in terms of assisting people who are you know mainly employed in the fur industry to to getting other jobs that's something i i don't really know about um uh i know there's a lot of research yeah. on kind of what actually works and from what i've from what i've read it sounds like a lot of the research seems to show that retraining programs actually are not that effective <laughs> that right. people end up pretty stuck in a particular skill set and in industry the, so okay, I, the, here, here's, the, here's the here's the real the real issue is that this is not an incredibly high skilled profession yeah and these people you know, uh, the the rest of the economy can absorb them, mm -hmm. and you know you have like um, other other things that people shouldn't be doing, like you know guards at private prisons mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something. And there is some there is something else for those people to do. Yeah. And there's when you when you ban a thing, when you ban an industry that's bad, you're going to have some people, even if it helps the economy in the long run, which I think this will. It will. Some people will have difficulty in the transition. There'll be a few people who, and that's unavoidable. It's up to us to. Rec it's up to us to help them, even as animal advocates. Right. We should be helping Tell you them what, transition. If you, if you, if if the fur ban goes through without the exemption, and if you are a fur farmer who lose your job, you call me and I will help you find a job. There you go. <laughs> there you go. A columnist. You call Bloomberg. me and I will help you find a job. Noah Smith will help you find a <laughs> I job. I will help you find a and job. I will commit to helping you find a job. Wayne well. will help you find a and job. We have a mailing list of 150,000 people in California. Yes. We have business owners. We've got lobbyists. We've got all sorts of professions. I will not only help you find a job, I will train you. New idea for animal rights activism yeah. is job assistance finding services for people who transition out of those industries. That's a great idea. That might be happening fairly soon. Stay all tuned. Right. We've got a story about nice. someone. I, I can't say anything too much, but. There okay. could be someone in the farming industry coming to visit Berkeley pretty soon who wants to transition out of it, and he could be a very powerful story for there the future. Go. But I can't give too much away. All right, we'll take one more question. Okay, uh, I think we actually only have one more quick one from Julie. Can we clarify? She says Laura Friedman is, as the bill's author, she's the exception of the person you can call outside your district? Or yeah, If you want, but I, I, but I, I don't know about that. Her I mean, mailbox is already full. She's been getting a ton of calls about yeah. it. Uh, so, I, so she knows. Yeah. It's just, you know... 
Call your representative. Call your representative. So, so not every representative knows about this yet. So, so David Chu really does. Mm -hmm. He knows about it. He gets it. Yeah. There's and probably a lot of representatives. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a lot of representatives who haven't yeah. heard this argument, uh, you know, who aren't as intimately acquainted with the reasons why the rabbit exemption is bad. Yeah. So, so let your representative know that's job number one. After that, do what you like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, there's so many other things you can do. You can email them too. So oh, yeah, email. If, you, if you can't make a phone call during business hours, they do count the emails. There's actually pretty good research. There's even been some yeah. RCTs yeah, showing people, that people emails and phone calls do influence. There's one study by David Berger, I think at Michigan State, showing that uh, an email campaign increased the odds that a legislator would support a particular initiative by 10 to 20%, which is huge, massive impacts. And I think the number of emails at issue were like 15, like 15 emails from constituents in their district would increase their odds of, I, I, don't quote me on this because I have to go back and look at the study, but the impacts are massive. And at the level of state legislation and state assembly members, they don't get a lot of phone calls and emails. It's, it's not nearly as, as notorious, it's not as much in the public radar as national legislation like the Affordable Health Care Act. So you could be one of 15 calls on a bill, right? And so make one phone call, one email, and you could make a material difference in the odds this legislator will actually pass the bill or prevent an exemption from getting to the bill that would be very damaging. Right. Okay, so I don't. Do you have any final thoughts you want to conclude with, Nah? Um, no, I mean, like this. This fur ban is great. Um, you know, as long as they, as long as they don't allow rabbit fur in the in the end, this will be a big step forward for the state of California. It will ultimately be good for our economy, and it will be a, a great thing to do. Um, so people are out there out there fighting for this. Help us join the fight. You can make some some you know a, a positive difference in in the lives of some animals as well as the future of California. And you heard it from Noah Smith himself. I'm gonna conclude by just asking you all to share this because even though the live stream is ending, if you share this, other people will see it. And finally, I'll ask you, and frankly, Jonah will ask you, if you, if you have a few bucks to spare for the animals, we are an active membership drive um, campaign. Right now, we, we have a membership drive campaign where bunnies like Jonah will benefit to the tune of $100 if you become a member. All it takes is a couple bucks. Who on this live stream has a couple bucks? Surely all of you have a couple bucks, right? If you have a couple bucks, share a couple bucks with the animals and we get $100 only over the next couple months. So go to dxc.io slash member, become a member today. You get to join weekly conference calls with a bunch of uh, amazing people or members. You get exclusive video content and you get to know that you're helping bunnies like Jonah. All right, thank you everybody.